Have you ever felt like you're called by God to do something, but there's just absolutely no way you can do it? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV. We are discovering the Bible, the 66 books written by 40 authors over 1500 years, all the same theme. Corey and Ryan are here today to let us know what they're doing. Corey? I'm taking a look at a really interesting archaeological site that may provide evidence of a centralized government at the time period of Saul and David. Ryan? Well, today we read about David cutting off a piece of King Saul's robe, and my report shows why that act was so significant. All right, very good. And Janice, what'd you do? Allied with God. All right, let's open up our Bible, open up our Bible guide. Let's look at the most important book of all, that is the Bible, and hear what God is saying. First Samuel 26, verses 25 through chapter 27, verse 9. Then Saul said to David, May you be blessed, my son David. You shall both do great things and also still prevail. So David went on his way, and Saul returned to his place. And David said in his heart, now I shall perish some day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines, and Saul will despair of me to seek me any more in any part of Israel. So I shall escape out of his hand. Then David arose and went over with the six hundred men who were with him to Achish, the son of Maok, the king of Gath. So David dwelt with Achish at Gath, he and his men, each man with his household, and David with his two wives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail the Carmelitess, Nabal's widow. And it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, so he sought him no more. Then David said to Achish, If I have now found favor in your eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So Achish gave him Ziklag that day. Therefore Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. Now the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was one full year and four months. And David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites. For those nations were the inhabitants of the land from of old, as you go to Shur, even as far as the land of Egypt. Whenever David attacked the land, he left neither man nor woman alive, but took away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the apparel, and returned and came to Achish. 1 Samuel chapter 26 through to 1 Samuel chapter 27 to verse 9. First Samuel 24, 25, 26, 27, and 28. These are chapters we're going to cover today. And we're going to focus on one of the chapters, believe me. Now, sometimes we may feel that we cannot do what God has called us to do. Have you ever felt that way? I have. We fall into what we think is the next best thing or our only option at the time and continue living our lives as though we failed. Or perhaps we may feel that we had no choice but to fail. But you know, God knows the future. God knows the past. God knows the present. He is the one who determines what his will is and how it will be established. The times that we think we've chosen the next best thing may actually be the exact timing God has confined and thus called us to in order to do his will. Interesting. Now that is what happened to David. David, the young man, anointed to be 
Israel's king, who ran from the demonically influenced and deeply jealous Saul. David thought it would be better for himself if he simply faded away into the enemy city. But unbeknownst to David, he ended up retreating to a place where he could and would finish and accomplish what Israel had not done for years. God's will. David conquered Israel's enemies and destroyed the wealth and establishment the enemies had built in the land because Israel's king could not. Saul was working for the enemy, you see. Now, this is fascinating. I, you know, there's a lot of things here that we need to consider, but we need to pray about this. Now, I want to remind you to get your Bible guide. If you don't have it, this is a good time to do so. Write to us or call us. Another way you can get it quickly is by going to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Click on the page. It'll take you to a donate page. Thank you so much for your donations. They're very important. So thank you for that. Then it'll take you to a page where you can download the March Bible Guide exactly as it is printed. And uh, you have it for March. It's very, very interesting. And I need to pray because we're going to be talking about accomplishing God's goal. Father, we think about goals a lot. There are people who have made videos on goals and television programs on our goals. Help us, Father, to accomplish your goals. You have goals that you have set for us. Help us not to think about what we want to do, but help us to think about what you want us to do, because what you want us to do is better than what we want to do. And I pray, Lord, that you would teach us your way and show us your path. In Jesus' wonderful name, and we said together, amen and amen. Let's look at the scripture. 1 Samuel 26. This, this is fascinating. 26.25 to 27.4. We're going to read part of this here. 26.25 says, Then Saul said to David, May you be blessed, my son David, for you shall both do great things and also still prevail. This is when he confronted David one time. So David went on his way and Saul returned to his place. And David said in his heart, because he knew Saul was lying, now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. Therefore, there is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines, the enemies of Israel. And Saul will despair of me to seek me anymore in any part of Israel. So I shall escape out of his hand. Then David arose and went over to the 600 men who were with him to Achish, the son of Maoch, king of Gath, Philistines. So David dwelt with Achish at Gath, and he and his men, each man with his household, and David with his two wives, Ahinom, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the Carmelitess, Nabal's widow. And it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, so he sought him no more. Now, it looks like David ran off and hid. David moved into his enemy's camp with 600 of his men. Ha, I think this is funny because God has a plan for us. Where we are now may not be where we're going to stay. I want to tell you something because where God places us, there are people who need to know Jesus Christ. And we don't deal with the way they dealt with the enemy in the past. We love our enemies now. And we teach them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And we show how Jesus Christ works in our life. And the enemy loses his grip on them. Wherever it is, that's the most important thing. Is Are there people around us who need to know Jesus Christ? I think there are. Very interesting. All right. 1 Samuel 27, 5 says, Then David said to Achish, If I have now found favor in your eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So Achish gave him Ziklag that day. Therefore Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. Interesting. But wait, it's not over. Verse 7 says, Now the time that David dwelt in the country 
of the Philistine, here's, here's what it is, was one year and four months. One year and four months. David was given Ziklag and was behind enemy lines. His story was just beginning. It was not ending. David thought his story was over, but it's not. Our life story on earth is not done until God takes us away. God takes us away, then our life's done because we're in heaven and God gives us our eternal purpose. But until God takes us off this planet, we're not done. Very important. So spirit of suicide, I reject you in the name of Jesus Christ and any other spirit that's depressing or calling people down. Spirit of murder, I reject you in the name of Jesus Christ. We're here to save people. All right, 1 Samuel 27, 8, 9. And David and his men went up and raided the Gershonites, another enemy of Israel, and the Gershon and the Gerizites, another enemy of Israel, and the Amalekites, an enemy of Israel. For those nations were the inhabitants of the land from old, as you go to shore, even as far as the land of Egypt. Whenever David attacked the land, listen carefully, he left neither man nor woman alive, but took away the sheep and the oxen and the donkeys and the camels and the apparel and returned and came to Achish. This is absolutely fascinating. You see, David accomplished what Israel had not been able to complete. You see, we must follow the Lord God as if our lives are on the line, because they are. Follow the Lord God as if our lives are on the line, because they are. Beloved, God has his way. Isn't it great to be alive right now? A lot of people have said, oh, I don't want to be out of here. Well, hold on a minute. If the Holy Spirit has given us life right now, praise God. We're going to do something for the Lord, and we're going to teach people about who Jesus Christ is, because that's what God told us to do. Jesus Christ is the Son of God came and died on the cross, we killed him, but on the third day rose in a miraculous way. Then he ascended to heaven and he told us, if you invite me into your life, I will be Lord of your life and forgive you of your sin. Amen. Hi, Rod Hembry. We go through the Bible in one year. It's exciting, it's great. And you can join us by searching Bible Discovery TV on your phone. That's right, on your phone, your iPhone or your Android phone. And when you do so, you'll find the app. You can download the app and watch it anytime you want. Never miss a program right here on Bible Discovery TV. We'll see you there. Today, you and I are going to be taking a look at a really interesting site called Kerbet Kaafa. Now, this site was occupied for a short amount of time, but it may represent a strong centralized government at the time period of King Saul or King David. Take a look. In seven excavation seasons, the small Judean site of Kerbet Kaafa was excavated. It was occupied for only a brief time between 1020 BC and 980 BC, a time attributed to the first and second kings of Israel, Saul and David. Kaafa then is evidence of a capable centralized government in Israel during this early period. Not only that, it's also found on the road that led from the Philistines' city of Gath to Jerusalem. Strategically, this makes a lot of sense. The Bible tells us of all the trouble between Israel and the Philistines during the days of Saul and David. Though Kaafa was small, it was fortified with a 13-foot thick stone wall and uniquely had two fortified gates. These gates, the city's location and date all point to one biblical identification for the city, Shiraim, which in Hebrew means two gates. Historically, this site would have been witness to one of the most famous biblical events, the fight of David and Goliath. David standing for Israel, Goliath standing for Philistine, fought in the Elah Valley that Kaafa overlooks. Being so close to the Philistine border has caused archaeologists to carefully consider who Kaafa belonged to, and the evidence is firmly on the side of Israel. The main entrance faced Jerusalem, no pig bones were found, the style of the wall and pottery were common in Judah, and a now famous early Hebrew inscription was found. It's called the Kaafa Ostrakon, and it's the largest inscription found at the site. It's five lines of proto-Canaanite script have been identified as ancient Hebrew. And though 
it can't be fully deciphered, this ink on pottery records something in the realm of ethics and justice, piquing the interest of the Bible reader and simultaneously providing evidence for the literacy of early Israel. During the last season of excavation at Kayafa, archaeologists uncovered what they call a palatial building at its very center. This building could have been several stories high and was likely the city's administrative center overlooking the site and boasting a commanding view of the entire Ila Valley. You know, uh, it's really interesting when you begin to compile the evidence for the life of King David. There is much less for the life of King Saul historically. Uh, but you know, in a few days, it, it, next week, we're going to do just that. We're going to be taking a look at all of the interesting evidence that exists for the life and the reign of King David. Now, this type of site, Kerbet Kayafa, is just one example in, you know, an array of evidence that lines up towards the reality and the existence of King David. Very interesting. And, and uh, as you study these places and all of that, it tells us more about the culture, tells us more about the surroundings that's going on here. And that, mm -hmm. that becomes important. The world of King David, like where, well, what was he familiar with? What was he dealing with? What was his as, culture? Yeah. You know, what, the, what are some of the things about that? So that becomes important because we tend to judge people based on what we think today, but that's using our culture mm -hmm. to do that. Here we're looking at their culture and their things to tell us. Yeah, trying to understand it from their exactly. perspective. Very yeah. good. Ryan? Yeah, well, today we read about King Saul's continuing effort to find and kill David. And in 1 Samuel 24, Saul enters a cave to relieve himself. But what he doesn't know is that David and his men are in the back recesses of that cave. Now, while David could have easily taken Saul's life here, he chooses only to sneak up behind him and cut off a corner of his robe. Now, this may not seem like a big deal to you or me, but in the ancient Middle Eastern culture, it was very, very significant. And we see that it is significant to David by his regret of even doing this. And the question is why? Well, in order to fully understand the meaning requires some cultural background study, as well as some diligent Bible study. And our scriptural starting point is actually gonna be a passage in Isaiah chapter six. So let's go. In the year that King Uzziah died, declares the prophet Isaiah, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. In the ancient cultures, garments played an important role, which is why Isaiah's observation concerning the Lord's robe, and specifically to the train of his robe, is especially significant. The Hebrew word for train is shul, which means hem, border, fringe, bottom edge of a skirt or train. In the ancient world, the hem or fringes of a garment represented authority. Thus, to cut off the hem of one's garment was to strip that person of his authority and personality. In fact, a husband could divorce his wife by simply cutting off the hem of her robe. A nobleman could authenticate his name on a clay tablet by pressing his particular hem on a clay tablet. It was like a signature or seal. Thus, when David cut off the hem of Saul's garment, he was cutting off his genealogy that was embroidered in the hem. That was his symbol of kingship. This is why David later repented of that act against the Lord's anointed. Joseph's so-called coat of many colors was actually a seamless robe with a special hem, which implied a position of privilege. When Ruth asked Boaz to put his hem over her, she was putting the claim of leveret marriage upon him, which he of course accepted. In God's covenant with Israel, he declares in Ezekiel 16:8, I will spread the edge of my garment over thee. In other words, God was putting his authority, his mantle, his protection, and his covering over Israel. In fact, according to the Mosaic law, every Jew was obliged to wear a fringe or tassel at each of the four corners of the outer garment, one thread of each tassel to be deep blue. These tassels were to be to them a perpetual reminder of the law of God and of their duty to keep it. This means that Jesus, as an obedient Jew, would also have had these tassels. In fact, this was the very hem which the woman with the issue of blood wanted to touch, because conceptually, that's where his authority was. Of course, Jesus also wore a seamless robe, which interestingly enough was never torn during his crucifixion, perhaps signifying that his priesthood is without end. Indeed, according to the vision of Isaiah, our Lord still wears a robe in his heavenly habitation, and the train or hem of that robe fills the temple. 
Hence, as Jesus himself declared to his disciples in Matthew 28, 18, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So the train, hem, or edge of the garment in the ancient cultures represented authority. And when we come to realize this, it brings illumination to so many different Bible passages. I mean, Genesis 37, Isaiah 6, Matthew 9 and 28, Ezekiel 16, and today's assigned reading of 1 Samuel 24. Now, wouldn't it be a great personal prayer that if we were to ask God to spread the hem of his garment over us? Just a thought. Yeah, that's really important. And again, this is looking at the culture. Mm -hmm. of the ancient times to fully understand and get what was happening yeah. then. It really, really helps us to, to really grasp what was going on. And I think that's important today is not to, I mean, this is what we've learned to do with social media is we judge everything by what we think. But, you know, with the Bible, you can't do that. You've got to understand how they thought and how they did things. And so when you understand that, then it helps you to begin to hear what God is saying. And that's one of the reasons why the Bible's one of the most misunderstood books in the world. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. Thank you, Ryan. Janice? Well, this chapter, we hear from Ryan about the first chance that David gets uh, to take Saul's life and spares him. And this chapter, we see a second time where David has the perfect opportunity to kill the man that has been chasing after him day by day by day. And he and Abishai come up to the camp of the people where Saul is by night and they're sleeping. And Abishai even says, ah, David, God has given you this great opportunity. We can just go over and I'll take that spear and I'll thrust it through Saul and he won't even know what hit him basically. But David is allied with God. And that's what I named this segment today, that as David allied himself with God, we too, who call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ, Christians, that we need to make sure that our lives are in a place that is allied with God. And yes, David was not a perfect man. We have read about it. We'll continue to read about that. Um, and there is none of us that are perfect, but we do follow the Lord Jesus Christ who can give us direction. So what am I talking about? David spares Saul a second time. He takes Saul's spear and a jug of water that was by his head, but he doesn't take the opportunity to kill him. And he's, he's following God's way against the temptation that Abishai gives him that God's given you this opportunity. Take it, take it, take it. And David says, but David said to Abishai, do not destroy him, for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and the guiltless? David said, furthermore, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall go out to battle and perish, which is eventually what does happen to Saul. But basically, David is saying, vengeance is mine says the Lord, and he knows he's not to go against the Lord's anointed, who at this time is King Saul of Israel. So God seems here to be testing David to see where his loyalties are. Is it in protection of himself, or is it to follow after what he knows God requires of him? So God is testing him here between verses 9 and 11. Then I love that the Lord works in mysterious ways behind the scenes for us sometimes. Why do I say that? Listen to verse 12. So David took the spear and the jug of water by Saul's head. Remember, they snuck down into the camp. They snuck into the camp and got close to King Saul. Not an easy feat to do. And they got away and no man saw or knew it or awoke. Listen to this part of the verse for they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen on them. God made this time an opportunity for David and Abishai, really testing them to see who they were allied with. What kind of motivation would they have to take care of themselves and end a problem right now an easy way or to follow through what David knew was God's ways for his life? So God works in mysterious ways behind the scenes that we don't even know. Obedience to God in every situation is critical. 
Uh, if we look at verse 23 to 25, may the Lord repay every man for his righteousness. So this is David talking. David answered and said, here is the king's spear. Let one of the young men come over and get it. And if you read the story, you'll see that they called out to King Saul and they've got the evidence. I've got the spear. I've got the jug of water and we spared your life. And that gave opportunity for David to continue on with his discussion. He had an audience, let me tell you, because Saul's men did nothing to protect their king. And there was the evidence. So David said, here's the king's spear. Let one of the young men come over and get it. Can you imagine if you were the young man that was chosen to go and get it? <laughs> what, I wonder what they're going to do to me when I go and get it. But David took this opportunity. May the Lord repay every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered you into my hand today, but I would not stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. And indeed, as your life was valued much this day in my eyes, so let my life be valued much in the eyes of the Lord and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. And Saul, his enemy said, to David, may you be blessed, my son David. You shall both do great things and also still prevail. So David went on his way and Saul returned to his place. He was even blessed by his enemy rod. But did you hear what David say? May the Lord repay every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness, for the Lord delivers. It is paramount that we follow the Lord with all of our heart, with all of our soul and all of our strength. We need to love him in every way. Today we pray, Lord, help me to reevaluate my thoughts and why I'm here. I need to recognize you. Father, thank you for that in Jesus' wonderful name. And we said together, amen. And beloved, remember, at 3.30, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 3.30 to 4.30, we're on Facebook, YouTube, and we're on BibleDiscoveryTV.com with a prayer meeting live. And we want to pray for you. So make sure you make time to join us, or you can watch afterwards. We record it.